This is the BBC. Dear brothers and sisters, all are welcome here at the Confessions podcast, whether saint or sinner. Well, hello again, and hope you're still busy, me, and you've been counting the hours until my return. In this, the second of our three special summer Confessions podcasts. Sorry, who is this? Who are incredibly you familiar. funny. I know, I know, that's show business and so on. Anyway, I was talking to my friend, the listener here, Joe, and obviously I know you're in the room, but I was talking to the listener. Yeah, once upon a time I was your friend and you did talk about bringing me something back from your holiday, but... Well, in theory I'm still on holiday and I've only jetted back just to do the podcast. We have discussed this and I am saving up. OK, all right, I guess anticipation then sets in. Uh, should we get on with the business of doing this thing? OK, so as I was saying, hello and welcome to this special podcast uh, bringing you some more confessions gold. And today featuring a collection of holiday-related confessions. And whether you're on a summer break or not, your own little holiday, these are stories guaranteed to put a smile on your face and we hope you enjoy these tales of holiday hilarity. Very professional. About my present. Yeah. Where is it? Please be seated. The first of this week comes from M. We're just calling him or her M. Dear Simon and the awesome assembly of palpable adjudicators. Forgiven. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) You're such a pushover. (laughs) You should be a judge. (laughs) Yes. That'd be good. Oh, no, we're coming up. Oh, yeah, it's fine. Say something nice about me. I wish to confess to you a story of a foreign trip from some seven years ago. My wife, Debs, and two-year-old son decided to head away on holiday to southern France on a posh camping trip. We decided to drive from our home in the English Midlands down to the French south coast. On planning this journey, we decided to complete it in two manageable chunks, stopping off at a hotel a few miles south of Paris to break up the journey. Always sensible if you've got a two-year-old in the car. We stopped at a lovely four-star hotel. We had a lovely meal, put our boy to bed nice and early. As such, we got ourselves ready for an early night. Now, this resulted in an early wake-up time, for me especially, so I decided to take advantage of the hotel facilities, specifically the lovely swimming pool, and I went for a very early morning dip. I rummaged around in the suitcases in our room for some some time and grabbed what I could in the dark whilst trying not to wake up anybody, and I reached for some shorts and trunks and thought I'd make sense of it when I got to the changing rooms. I headed down to the pool, entered the uh, empty changing room and realised I had grabbed my white shorts and a pair of budgie smugglers. <laughs> As you may be aware, white shorts are not ideal when wet and tend to reveal more than they should, and I really don't like wearing trunks. However, I thought the best thing would be to wear the trunks under the shorts to avoid any uh, issues of transparency. Okay. Yes, we're all with him. I went to the pool and it was deserted, completely and utterly empty. I could enjoy an early morning swim all on my own. Did a couple of lengths and was getting into the swing of things. I was, however, finding that my trunks were quite uncomfortable under my shorts. I had put a few uh, pre-holiday pounds on, to be honest, Father Simon, and they were feeling a little bit tighter than I recalled. I tried to persist with the swimming, but I was getting more and more uncomfortable. And then an idea struck me. In the middle of the still deserted pool, okay. how many people were around? No one was around. I would remove my white shorts, remove my trunks, and put back on the white shorts and carry on regardless. Then, should anyone have entered the pool area before I finished my swim, I would simply wait for them to be at the deep end whilst I got out and headed back to the changing rooms, thus reducing the risk of uh, any transparency-related embarrassment. Great plan. Can't go wrong, this. Absolutely can't go wrong. And of course it went swimmingly. In fact, nobody else entered the pool area and as such I had no need for any concern. I headed back to my room. Wife and boy were both dressed and up and we all headed down for a well-earned breakfast before we set off on the second half of our epic journey. We're all seated seated at a lovely table by a very pleasant, albeit I have to say quite giggly, waitress. In fact, it turned out that all of the waitresses were pretty giggly and also a little bit pointy. As in not pointy-headed, they were pointing at me. And they're also a little bit whispery. They were all whispering to each other a lot, as did many of the diners. Surely we couldn't have been the first British people they'd ever seen. Come on. It was at this point that I turned round to see the unique feature of this dining area. Oh, no. There was an incredible glass wall. Oh, no. Which was a viewing window to the underwater area of the pool. (laughs) And it ran... It ran alongside 
the whole of the pool. You could see people swimming and splashing and treading water. In fact, I have to be honest and say that the glass acted as a magnifier in oh. some oh, areas. Yeah. So if someone had decided to, let's say, remove their shorts, <laughs> they'd have been giving quite a show to everyone who was just enjoying their café au lait and a croissant. So clearly, this is what I need to say, says M, because I need forgiveness from my wife, who I have not told about this. And she's always wondered why there was a frisson, a rather odd atmosphere in that dining room that morning. I also seek forgiveness from the staff and the patrons of the dining room that morning, who must to this day wonder exactly what was going on. These English <laughs> exhibitionists, all of them, I can only apologise if it put them off saucisson for life. <laughs> Says Em. Quite unnecessarily. Yes, no quite unnecessarily uh, at the end. <laughs> But if you're married to M, well, that's quite that's going to be quite a shock. Why wouldn't yes. you just say, right, the reason they're all pointing and laughing is because... Anyway, uh, so let's uh, let's check in with Sister Bobby here, what she's making of that one. Uh, well, first of all, surely you'd have thought of security cameras, especially with public swimming pools, you know, in hospitals. There would have been, even if there was nobody there, there would have been... Well, maybe there weren't cam any. No, there would have just because of safety, if it's open underwater. to the public. Yes, I know, he's, but on top of the water. So the very fact that you stayed in the pool with your dangly legs out and got right. your trunks off and then thought that was a good... Just what part of that was a good idea that you thought, oh, this is OK? Why couldn't you just get out of the pool and do it? It's just ridiculous. Because well, people might see if you get out of the pool. Yeah, if you, you do it underwater, no-one's going to see. How, how lazy do you have to be that you can't go into oh, a I changing see. room and change your trunks that are now too small for you? Uh, uh, transparency and security should always double layer when you're wearing white. That's the thing, you is that, know. Is that the rule? That's the thing. Um, you should be asking for forgiveness from just about everybody. Your poor wife, the poor waitresses... I noticed nobody gave you free extra breakfast. So when you talk about a magnifying window, um, it still wasn't Steady. enough, was it, for a free breakfast? Anyway, uh, you're not forgiven, <laughs> Em. Uh, Brother Matthew. Yes. Um, well, it strikes me as a very sort of continental thing. Uh, my understanding of French swimming pools is that you're only you're not allowed to wear shorts. I obviously you have to wear trunks. You, you, they, they stop you wearing shorts. So actually, in a funny way, wasn't he actually you know complying with with our with our Gallic cousins in a in a way? What? I mean, what are the chances of there being uh, windows underneath the pool? I never checked that. None of us ever check it. Uh, so I'm obviously going to forgive because it could have happened to any of us. If we'd uh, decided to change our pants, it is in quite an interesting point. There would be quite a few people if they who would not want the bit the bits of you that are underwater to be viewed feels, by people having feels their breakfast. Feels a bit seventies, doesn't it? Feels a bit sort of hello, my dear. We've got <laughs> windows underneath the pool, you know. Really, uh, I think I'll go somewhere else. The Confessions Podcast. Here we go with this t uh, top tale here from Tom in Derby. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Father Simon, my story takes place in 1986 when I was a 23-year-old cruise ship photographer working on a Norwegian ship that sailed every 14 days from Miami out to Jamaica, then calling into several small private islands around the Mexican coast and, ha and Haiti before returning to port in Florida. Not a bad job, you would you would think. Yeah, that's fair enough. Most of our passengers were American tourists, and if the photography team of us three British lads on the ship were lucky, there might sometimes be a group of young single people for whom we could provide a valuable photographic service, as well as perhaps keeping them company at the endless poolside parties and the late-night beach discos. It was a tough job, Father Son. Someone had to do it. Mm. On this particular cruise, a party of about two dozen friends had come away to celebrate two of their number's upcoming marriage. And it turned out that they had also chosen this particular time of year because the bride-to-be was a particularly, particularly enthusiastic amateur astronomer. And apparently the lack of light pollution in the middle of the Caribbean Ocean provided an ideal opportunity to view Halley's Comet. The group of partying American yuppies were living it up to the max every night as the actual wedding ceremony was scheduled for two days before the ship's return to port. As a result, virtually every evening before the wedding itself ended up being a succession of stag parties for the groom's friends and, of course, hen -dos for the bride's companions. In the hedonistic mix of Caribbean sun, late nights on paradise beaches by open wood fires and open-air top-deck pool dances on the ship, it was probably inevitable that we English star photographers were proving quite popular with one or two of the holiday-making American lasses. 
<laughs> With our deliberately over-exaggerated 1950s BBC information film accents, our penchant for sharp tuxedos, self-tie bow ties that were undone after dinner in the bar, and vast, expendable, tax-free, cash-in-hand income, we were quite full of champagne and very full of ourselves. In any event, the incumbent bride had also brought an incredibly expensive, powerful telescope on board with which her and her friends would scan the sky every night for Halley's Comet. However, even through the powerful super optics of this device, Halley's just looked like a slightly bigger dot than a lot of smaller dots around it, as far as I was concerned, and I thought that was about as exciting as watching paint dry. I did, however, seem to be getting along very well indeed with a lady we'll call Julia, who was another stargazing fanatic, and I pretended to, ooh and ah, look at that! the amazing spectacle unfolding through the telescope's lens whenever Julia was nearby. A few weeks before the wedding ceremony, we called into Jamaica, where I had to take a taxi into town to pay some money into my employer's company bank account. I suddenly had a terrific idea. As I was passing the local reference library, I popped in to see if there were any books about astronomy, perhaps even particularly about Halley's Comet, to swat up and impress Julia even further with my encyclopedic knowledge of the night sky. Well, wouldn't you know it, the second large hardback book that I opened contained a super clear 10-inch colour plate of the comet, an artist's impression based on something taken by a radio telescope somewhere. The image was so deeply impressive that I decided to prop the page up by the window and take a daylight picture of the picture. Fast forward to later that evening and we were selling off dozens of 8 by 6 Halley's Comet souvenir prints, $10 each, which we claimed had been taken in the middle of the night on our special super zoom telephoto lens. Mm. Mm -hmm. Making quite I'm with you, yeah. lovely. Needless to say, we continued to be quite the hit with the American wedding party and during a particularly late night champagne fueled poolside bash, which also happened to be the night before the couple's wedding, the aforementioned Julie and I agreed that it was an ideal opportunity for her to come to my cabin and view my photographic portfolio. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Much editing required to this one, wasn't it? Uh, 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 rewording. <laughs> A few pages. <laughs> After an intense night with Julia discussing the work of Cartier-Bresson, David Bailey and other matters of fine art, I was bleary-eyed and severely hungover all the next day. On top of this, I was due to take the wedding photos of the happy couple and also carry on with my other regular duties. The wedding day passed without incident and a matter of days later, Julia had flown home to California. I was genuinely pining for her, but throwing myself into my work to take my mind away from my lovesick heavy heart. I threw myself so much into the work, in fact, that I printed all the pictures of the wedding, the hen parties, stag parties, formal portraits of the bride, groom and family, in one night without stopping. I overdid it rather, staying up again all night putting the negatives and prints into envelopes to post the next day from Miami post office. Sadly that evening I made a couple of significant errors. Uh -uh. And so I seek forgiveness from the bride's mother for sending her stag party photos with images of an Elvis impersonator with his underpants on his head and an extremely rude word written in lipstick on his buttocks. <laughs> I seek forgiveness from the bridegroom for sending his newly acquired mother-in-law the pictures of him being sick in an ice bucket. I also seek forgiveness from Julia for sending my declaration of undying love not to her, but in error to the bride's parents, <laughs> together with a fairly graphic description <laughs> of my portfolio oh, and yeah. how she could yes. check out my portfolio okay. when we met next time. Unsurprisingly, that turned out to be, guess what, pal, never again. Finally, I seek forgiveness from the National Geographic magazine publishing company for blatant copyright theft and making a quick and dirty profit from it. What a terrible mess. I've wrestled with my conscience for 30 years over this. Can I ever find peace of mind from your ecumenical radio team? Tom in Derby, two things here. He passed off uh, uh, a beautiful photograph of Halley's Comet as his own sold stuff and then a whole bunch of and then the mistake sending the wrong photographs to the wrong people uh, with hours of endless entertainment sister bobby two parts first of all <laughs> i wonder whether you're a photographer now i think not because no genuine photographer with the love of the work would ever fake a photograph like that i know this is beyond you know kind of photoshop and all those things i just think that is unforgivable you and think? you should know yes mm -hmm. i think so because and also for your own very 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 shallow ends there was no point but he really. loved julia no he didn't really love julia did he just loved her for that minute uh, or that night maybe anyway the second thing for making a mistake with the photographs well you made yourself tired Yes. You know, your own professional, you're at work. It was the going over the portfolio that made him tired. Yeah, so I don't think I can forgive you. 
OK, Tom, it's not looking very good so far, Norris. What do you make of that? Well, gosh, it's a roller coaster for me because they have a three young blood would-be James Bonds there. I didn't mind much for plagiarism. I didn't mind the uh, $10 a pop. I thought that was pretty enterprising. A bit worried about a stag and a hen on the same cruise line. I think that's got trouble written all over it. Um, but having uh, you know witnessed uh, Julia's comment, not everything, uh, you know, he then blew it, didn't he, by actually uh, sending it to all the wrong people. So, Tom, you've made a massive error, but because... You, I don't, by the sound of it, ever saw her again. I'm going to forgive you, 30, kid. Year, 30 years ago, uh, do you forgive yeah, this? Yeah, you never what saw you her think? again. Uh, this sounds like the cruise from hell. Imagine being on that boat and realising, oh, good, there's a hen party and a stag party, mm. and it's going to be every night. Stag and hen parties are basically brilliant as long as you're in them. If you're anywhere near them, it's hell on earth, and therefore hell on a boat. So I am not going to forgive just because I can't stand stag parties and hen parties when I'm not in them. The Confessions Podcast. Simon and the Absolving Assemblage. My sorry tale takes us back 25 years. It's 1991, John Major is the Prime Minister, Tim Berners-Lee is busy inventing the internet, and Brian Adams, everything I do, was number one, like forever. We, like forever, just like they spoke in 91. We lived in London at that time and were fairly newly married. My husband and I, plus our two-year-old son, went on holiday. One that was forever to be known as the holiday with the hills and the rain. We'd packed up our four Granada Scorpia and set off for the Lake District. It was beautiful but sodden, raining almost every day as far as I recall. We hired bikes, fed ducks, walked a lot and even did a boat trip onto one of the lakes, all in the pouring, lane, uh, pouring rain. I'd booked to stay at a guest house in Keswick, comfortable but modest, with a lovely owner who fed us very well. We had booked bed and breakfast and evening meals so we wouldn't have to find a different restaurant every night with a two-year-old in tow. Uh, there will be um, and d different times, obviously, so none of those easy, <laughs> spicy chicken restaurants with pizza places up in the lakes. So, you know, this was a wise option that we'd gone for. Whilst I now think that I'm a pretty good cook, at that time our regular diet was probably less than wholesome. Being young and not having a lot of money, we ate 90s staples such as spag bol and lasagna, basically any other instant pasta that was knocking around. So a few days of eating local meat and lots and lots and lots of local veg in the B&B, &B, I began to notice a change in my habits. <laughs> <laughs> Just mm. saying that. Mm. One particular day, events took a turn that could not have been predicted. We were out driving one afternoon around the lovely hills and dales of Cumbria in the rain. Having lived in London all our lives where everything is quite close together, we perhaps didn't appreciate the distance between towns and villages on the AA route planner travel map. So we'd been driving for a while and I felt an inevitable call of nature <laughs> on the way and oh yes maybe we could find somewhere soon I really needed the loo and no a quick trip behind the bush would not have helped so I say to my husband who's driving please can you find somewhere it's urgent we're in the middle of nowhere and he says I'll pull over and you can go in that field mm. briefly why are you looking at me concerned? Are there any animals involved? Briefly, I genuinely <laughs> consider this as an option. Was there enough cover? What kind of leaves are best? No, I decided. Uh, I need to go now. Find me somewhere else, I demanded. We drove on with me getting more and more distressed and crossing everything in an attempt not to... I'll cross that next bit out. So <laughs> I left that one. The moorland and the odd lone sheep stared back at me through the car window. The road turned and suddenly... What a relief. There was a pub, swinging sign outside, the lights were on. Father Sam, the relief I felt at seeing that sight was almost as good as the relief I anticipated. Stop! I yelled, leapt out of the car before it had fully stopped. Obviously, you don't encourage that kind of thing. I dashed across the road, don't encourage that kind no. of thing. Down the footpath, into the pub, straight through the door. There's a man standing in the middle of the saloon bar. In fact, it looked like he just jumped up from his seat. Please, please, which way to the ladies? He didn't say anything at all. He just pointed to the right. I didn't wait to be given any verbal instructions. I legged it, locked the door, sat down. I think you can imagine my utter joy, relief, bliss and liberation. Oh, thank you. That was absolutely terrific. It was then that I looked around the room. Mm. Oh, no. This pub didn't smell like a pub. It no, it didn't. It didn't feel like a pub. <sighs> Toothbrushes, talcum powder, a bath. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little unusual. And it was then that the penny dropped. Well, actually, the penny had dropped, but, you know, now the other penny dropped. I had just burst into a complete stranger's house and demanded to use their toilet. And to be honest... I'll cross that next bit out. Yeah. I tidied myself... 
took a few deep breaths. Actually, it wasn't such a good idea. Uh, so I held my head up, unlocked the door, and went back to the bar, which was a lounge. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the man was still standing there, looking at me, now joined by his wife, I imagine. They had quite a nice sofa, as I recall. Um, sorry about that. I saw the sign outside. I thought you were a pub. The man says, no, we're not. <laughs> right, I'll be off then. And I scarper back to the car where my husband and son were waiting, looking rather amused as I come running out, shouting, go, 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 leave now! <laughs> so, Father Simon, clearly I need to be absolved of this terrible sin <clears throat> for storming into a stranger's house and leaving my mark. But, to be honest... What were they doing with a swinging sign outside the house in the first place? Says Anne. Mitigating circumstances. We, we had a kind of a misguided moment about going yeah, into was... the wrong house a few months ago, <laughs> uh, which is a fine thing. But you can imagine in your desperation, you're not going to maybe do all the checks. But this guy, he would have had the shock of his life. Anyway, maybe it's his fault. Who knows? Sister Bobby. That's a perfect serendipity. I love that. Can you imagine if they're not if the door wasn't open? Because obviously the door was open because she could go charging through. Mm. It's a lovely set of circumstances where everything went right, I think. I don't think really there's a lot to be forgiven. What I like is the idea of the family then telling the same story from their point of view for years and years and years about the strange mad woman that came crazy. Weird woman from into, London. Yeah, that she went straight to the things. house. What could he do? I'm sure we've all seen it. We've all been there. We've all seen it. It's perfectly fine. What a lovely, hilarious story. You Novice forget? Nigel. Yeah, 25 years ago, everyone left the door open, didn't they? And uh, they? swinging signs probably meant something else. Um, but I uh, can you imagine my son on the way home saying, uh, where are the Chris and mum? I had a very similar experience. <laughs> yes, very but funnily enough, ago. we don't want to know about it. But it was in Cuba, and I was doing, I was filming something, last piece of camera, and, and I did, I just had no. to carry on, and in very bad Spanish, <laughs> had to say to this very bemused Spanish family, I think they knew what I needed, and I needed it there, and I had to come back to England with a man nappy on. But anyway, <laughs> so you are, you are that. definitely, Anna, definitely forgiven on this occasion. We have to leave uh, that. Our mind went on for weeks. We have to leave that so. story there. I'm just going okay. to fade him out. I know, it wasn't good. I know, sorry, I just faded Nigel out. Uh, Matthew. <laughs> Um, yeah, I love this. I love both those stories. They're great. Um, going into the wrong house is all my fav always my favourite kind of confession. So, yes, definitely forgiven. We'd have all done it, wouldn't we? I mean, what are you going to do? You know, the house is open. <laughs> go in, you yeah. know. Well, you can't just go into someone else's uh, house. Well, you can, obviously you, you don't just look. go in. But she made a mistake and um, we'd all have done the same, I think. All right. Nigel no, is nappy. OK, well, no, I'm sorry, Nigel, you're still <laughs> faded down. You're not allowed back on the air. The Confessions Podcast. Gather round, here comes another drive time confession. Tonight's comes from Prankish Paula. That's how it's, and it's called Scareway to Devon. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah, made me laugh, you can probably tell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we got that, yeah. <laughs> but then that's quite easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nice butchers yeah. in Devon. <laughs> uh, so Paula says, Father Simon and the Humorous Collective. Well, I think you'll yes, be the judge of that. correct. Like many of your confessions, ours goes back 20 years or more. But unlike the majority, we cannot hope that youth and inexperience will help with forgiveness as we were already sliding out of control into middle age at the time, but without the usual wisdom that comes with it. Humour has always been a big part of our family life. My husband, let's call him Winston, and I, Paula done our best to toughen up our kids by telling them all sorts of rubbish which they happily believed and passed on to their friends and teachers. For years we've been jumping out of cupboards at them and generally <laughs> showing them the funny side of life <laughs> yeah. and how it helps in most situations. Mm. What's life like at home? Well, mum and dad, you know, they're jumping yeah. out of cupboards. Lively. But, <laughs> sounds like Cato. Yes. In the main, they and now the grandchildren have developed into well-rounded, interesting members of society and always have a funny story to tell at parties. I think the key <laughs> words in that <laughs> sentence were, in the main. In the main. <laughs> the incident in question happened one sunny day in Devon, hence the title of this, in the early 90s, when Winston and I managed to sneak away for a few days, just the two of us. We didn't have to spend any time in amusement arcades, family entertainment shows or any of the other usual holiday torture that parents have to endure, we took ourselves off on long country walks, ending up in pubs that provided the best beer and wine in the country. It was bliss. This particular day, we found ourselves off the beaten track on moorland, and after a longish walk, I decided to sit and enjoy the wonderful views while Winston strolled off down the hill to explore, calling out that he wouldn't be long, and then we'd find somewhere nice for lunch. 
Okay. Yeah, all yes. good so far. So yeah. Yeah. How could this possibly go wrong? <laughs> After a short time, I could hear his footsteps coming up the rocky path. With my renewed energy, oh, I no. thought oh, no. this oh, would be no. an ideal opportunity yeah. to liven the holiday up. Oh, no. So creeping behind a conveniently positioned <laughs> large rhododendron bush, fully bloomed with large deep plink deep deep pink flowers yeah. I waited silently as the steps came closer and closer. With years of practice I picked the perfect time to leap out with both arms and legs spread out like a star my best gurning face and my loudest warrior cry. Simon this is your bit. <laughs> hey, who are you? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Have a picture of that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You've done your trousers in there. My back hurts. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everything then seemed to happen in slow motion as a young couple in front of me, dressed in sensible walking gear, complete, <laughs> complete with map in a plastic container around Obviously, their necks, yeah. leapt into the air and a look of horror came over their faces. I scrambled away, muttering apologies and trying to explain that I thought they were my husband between them, which didn't seem to reassure them that much as they scrambled away in the opposite direction, desperate to find safety from the lunatic woman on the hill. Mm. Shortly afterwards, Winston appeared, crying with laughter. He'd heard the noise of my best warrior voice and the screams of the terrified couple and rather than come to help me with my explanation he decided to hide and let me mumble my way out of my embarrassment feeling winston had some serious brownie points to earn we made our way back towards the car with a promise of copious amounts of wine and a tasty lunch via the small wood trying to get into my good books with making me laugh a ruse which had helped him a lot over the years he suddenly leapt up on a tree bough and shinned up to the great height at the top of the tree with all the skill of a rather ungainly bear and proudly started to beat his naked chest like a gorilla whilst roaring his best Tarzan impersonation. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> go on. Another oh, chance to shine, Simon, <laughs> says Paula. Oh. Well, we've done the yodelling thing, yes. haven't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah so very much related. Of, yeah. I'm on top of the tree. Yeah. Don't forget he's Beating shirtless. a naked <laughs> chest. He is, yeah, you do need to be naked for yeah. this. Yeah. Is yeah. that right? There's, yeah. there's uh, no need for that. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. I think you've popped a rib. Gifted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But <laughs> gifted, but not in that way. No, no, no. He knows this is the best way to my heart, and helpless with laughter, I danced a jig. I was indeed his Jane, and it was at this point, of course, out of the corner of my eye, I spotted the same young, <laughs> sensibly dressed couple who had unfortunately also chosen that route, and without giving me the chance to explain this time, they sprinted away with a now familiar look of horror on their faces. <laughs> it's the lunatic woman on the hill. Run for your life. We obviously don't seek forgiveness from the young couple. We already apologised to them once, and by now they'll be middle-aged and hopefully we'll realise that people still play in the woods at ripe old ages. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yes, There's yes. Right. I'm writing that down. Yeah. However, we would... <laughs> play in the woods. <laughs> Nigel. <laughs> However, we would like to beg forgiveness to all the people who they will have told not to visit this beautiful area for safety reasons because they've missed a real treat. Now retired, we still hide in cupboards and jump out at each other. <laughs> But we've stopped using the airing cupboard at the top of the stairs for safety reasons. <laughs> now, Winston still usually wins the tree climbing races with the grandchildren. We hope the playful collective will see that laughter is the best medicine and see their way to complete absolution for us. I think of all, I mean, I like all the pranks and I like all, all of it. But to conclude by just saying we now don't jump out of cupboards anymore, particularly the airing cupboard at the top of the stairs. Yes. Wow. Paula and Winston, they sound like uh, interesting people to spend some time with. I bet they can yodel as well. Uh, Bobby, what do you think there? Oh, I want to go on holiday with these guys. I think the couple that uh, lost their sense of humour both times, uh, those are the people that should be avoided at all costs. I think people should be jumping out of cupboards, as long as it's safe to do so, of course, and more. This, these people really set an example. I think it's fabulous because, let's face it, life is full of all sorts of things, and if you can laugh at it, that's your only way. That Careful right? when you're climbing trees, though. Especially of a certain age. Because, you know, you, I watch quite a lot of 24 hours on A&E. And just be careful. Is that right? <laughs> That's all I'm saying, yeah. Have fun, but with care. Jumping Forgiven. Of, OK, all right. Uh, Nigel, yeah. You know, I love climbing trees still. That might surprise you. Uh, but he go, no, I thought it was even worse. I thought it might have involved Paula stripping to her underwear or something. Just where my mind Goodness raced to. Goodness me. Or uh, impromptu, heaven's sake. Yeah. <laughs> impromptu cliff diving. I thought it could have all gone. So actually, in the, well, I just thought someone <laughs> might have slipped and that was it. So well done, prankish Paula and Winston. But you are the type of grandparents I would love if I was a, a, a young... I would like you anyway. Even have you ever hidden in a cupboard and jumped out Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. Absolutely. You do that. Bobby, you do it. I don't do it enough, actually. You've just reminded me. I must do it more often. Who do you who do you jump out of a cupboard at? Well, lots of people, but I've lived with. But I must uh, do more uh, fun.
fun stuff at home, silly stuff at home. Why don't you Why don't you go to a BBC management cupboard <laughs> and then in the middle of a meeting, yes. wear your best sparkly yeah. frock and jump out and go, <laughs> well, hey, supplies. Next week. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Matt, what do you think? Uh, yeah, so every couple should really have uh, a warrior voice uh, that they share <laughs> together. I should be uh, suggesting that to, uh, to... You've got a warrior face. Yes, I've got a warrior face, definitely. That's uh, come out a couple of times. Um, I, I am obviously going to forgive, because number one, I always forgive. And number two, uh, because they managed to put your back out in doing your uh, star dance well, there. Uh, so, yes, I did definitely. actually genuinely do a star. Yeah. You I did, yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, and the beating of the chest. Mm. There's, a, there's a radio first. So that's a forgiveness. Yes. So rub some arnica on that later. Yeah. What? Why? On your rib. I think you did a rib. I can hear yeah. it go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going. It's okay. The Confessions Podcast. So here's, uh, here's tonight's tale. It comes from Kath. Uh, th- Kath, thank you very much Steve, for today's confession, which is topical, as you're about to find out. Simon and the Collective. It's always about this time of year, with the sun shining, so many global sporting events taking place. I am transported back several decades. We're going back to 1979. Pretty much to win darts. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we relied on to do some hits on the telly. Having left school with no idea what I wanted to do in life, it made perfect sense to take over the job my older sister had just finished. So as she left France, and returned to Scotland, I went off to France to work as an au pair, living with the family she'd been staying with. Life was idyllic. I lived in a large, sprawling farmhouse deep, really deep in the French countryside. It was such a remote little village that only one bus passed through it one day a week. I came to know everyone in the village and we very rarely had any visitors from outside as it really wasn't on any tourist map. We had no shops, there was a little bakery in the next village which I could reach in about 20 minutes on an ancient bike that was in one of the outhouses. It took me quite a while to master it. Getting on involved me leaning the bike against the wall, then climbing the wall and swiftly-ish taking off. I'm five foot and a little bit, says Kath. This bike was not only from the Stone Age, but also designed for a giant. The only way I could get on it was to tip the bike and myself sideways and hope for the best. I persevered, however, and often would freewheel down the steep hill to the next village. I wouldn't even attempt the hill climb on the way back, so I just pushed it slowly. Over time, I prided myself on discovering hitherto unknown paths and shortcuts. The most exciting discovery being the little overgrown path that I could take, which would take me out about a quarter of the way up the hill. I would then do my ritual of tipping off and walking the rest of the way up the hill to my village. One day I'd been out visiting a friend and was heading back home. The sun was shining and my legs were starting to ache. I didn't have too long to go, though, as I had already reached my secret pathway and only had to get to the end of it before climbing off the bike and walking up the hill. I'd already decided I would have a little rest at the bottom of the hill when I noticed an elderly couple sitting by the end of the path with a small picnic. What a weird place to come for a picnic, I thought, followed by the fact that I would now have to cycle past them and round the corner onto the hill and out of sight before my disembarking ritual could commence, because it was rather embarrassing, as I have explained. So, Simon, I was slightly put out by this couple, daring to picnic near my remote village. You can imagine how I felt then when I rounded the path onto the hill and discovered about 600 people lining both sides of the hill, picnic tables everywhere, wine, cheese, tablecloths wasn't any very puzzling, but when at the sight of me and my rust bucket, they started clapping and cheering and shouting, Ali, Ali! <laughs> it was with a heavy heart and even heavier legs that I realised there was no way I could tip myself off this bike. I'd have to attempt something I'd never achieved before and cycle up to the top of the dreaded hill. So I pushed on and upwards being cheered all the way. <coughs> Excuse me. With about 50 metres or so left to climb, the cheers suddenly became deafening. Wow, I thought, they're really enjoying this unlike me. It was then I realised and I heard the unmistakable roar of a car's engine. Great, I thought. Bad enough that all these people are now here. Now I've got to contend with a car too. And how dare they start beeping at me? This is my private road. A quick look behind and it all became horribly clear. This was not just any old car. The correct term for this particular one on that particular day was, I now know, the lead car. You see, because I had used little hidden roads and paths to reach my destination, it meant that I had avoided all the closed road signs and, quite by accident, had seemingly become an extra and unsubscribed participant in that year's Bourgogne stage of the Tour de France. (laughs) With a strength that probably came from sheer embarrassment, my little legs took on a life of their own... (coughs) Excuse me, as I had to get to the top of the hill... 
round the corner and into the farmhouse courtyard before the incensed car driver reached me. Amazingly, I managed it. It did cross my mind to demand a yellow jumper, as I'd surely earned it, but thought best to just lie low, and lie low I did. So I seek forgiveness, not from the crowds who had come to see the elite cyclists as they still managed to see them, I got an added bonus when I appeared. I can understand the trouble the lead car driver would have gotten into had I not managed my super sprint to finish. <coughs> That would, have been catas- that would have been a catastrophe had the real cyclists caught up with me, but they didn't, so no harm done. Where I perhaps should seek forgiveness is from my dad, himself an elite cyclist in his younger days, who competed in many similar events around Europe. One of his many titles won was the Scottish Uphill Champion. Had I listened a bit more to him about cycling techniques, I would probably have reached the top of the hill far quicker. Well, imagine that. <coughs> Excuse me again. Kath. You all right? Yeah. So <laughs> Not really. Kath finds herself at the head of the Tour de France and desperately trying to get out of the way on an old rust bucket and she's only five foot. Young Joe. Initially, I was getting images of Call Me By Your Name when you started to tell that story for some bizarre reason, it being in France and cycles and everything. Um, there's nothing to forgive here, just enormous respect for climbing up the hill on your bike and you absolutely deserved a yellow shirt at the end of it. And you were very much, I think, an uphill champion. So I, I just I just give you all the respect and I think you have nothing to be sorry or to forgive. OK, what do you say, Bobby Pryor? Well, here's the thing. Moral uh, compass of well, the Well, the thing, the problem what, what, is, what of course... Wrong? If you Well, I understand. What? She won the hill climb. She deserves a yellow jersey. In fact, though Kath I imagine your dad like my dad would be very very cross with you my dad is a cyclist oh. one of the things he used to get really cross about and was brilliant to watch him get cross at was people getting in the way of the cyclist so you were potential getting in the way of the troop because actually the impact is huge if someone is on that course and brings down you know the peloton that's huge so I'm going to say in memory of my dad Kath <laughs> you are not forgiven wow okay oh. uh, harsh but fair the Confessions Podcast. That was the second of our three special Summer Confessions podcasts. Hope you enjoyed listening wherever in the world you happen to be. Yeah, and I'm actually going to go on a little jaunt for a week or so. So I'll be off, going to the end of the pier to find a little present for you, you Simon. Can, well, you can come on holiday with me if you like. That would be, that would well, be an insane thing. Well, it's a very kind thing. offer, you, you can know. Bring your tribe can <laughs> join my tribe. <laughs> Um, maybe. Anyway, normal service resumed. We'll both be back on Monday the 20th of August. Hooray. I think that's when the reunion happens. Yes. See you in Edinburgh. Do join us then. The Confessions Podcast. Go in peace. <laughs>